Hello and welcome to today's Hip Historian event. I am Brenda Holt with the Arizona State Office of AARP. We are the nation's largest nonprofit, nonpartisan organization dedicated to empowering people 50 and older to choose how they live. In the month of February, we will focus on Black History Month. When you are a part of a community, it's inspiring to see those who go above and beyond, not only to make it feel like home, but make it thrive. ARP believes the efforts of one person or one community can truly make an impact, but we combine our efforts for the greater good, we thrive together. We honor community leaders dedicated to coming together to transform, uplift, and educate communities. Visit us at aarp.org backslash black community to learn more. Thank you again, and with that, I'll turn it over to Marshall. Well, hello and good evening. I want to welcome you all to Arizona History Happy Hour. I am so happy you are here with us this evening. Oh my gosh, have we got an incredible show tonight. Oh my gosh. So I want to welcome you all. Yeah, you know, I know we've got at least Frank off in New York on LinkedIn. Um, a bunch of you are watching on Facebook. And, you know, even, you know, what I love is also the Twitch crowd is growing little by little. So... Is so happy to see you all on this amazing February 16th of 2023. You know, so we just passed Statehood Day, but we'll talk more about that in just a little bit. But today, back in 1913, the first train to serve Fort Huachuca arrived at the fort at 4.35 p.m. on the El Paso and Southwest Line, thereby opening up that whole Southern Arizona. And oh my gosh. All right. So we also have, it is be kind to a grouch day. You know, there's nothing better to do than do a grouch a favor, helping someone who's very grumpy, help them turn that mood around as, you know, I think the cheesy thing would be to say, you know, turn that frown upside down. That's what today is all about. Now, it is also National Almond Day. You can eat them right out of the bag. You can make them into milk. You can do pasta, flour, oil, butter, all kinds of things. They're super healthy. And today we're celebrating the almond and all those vitamins that are packed inside of them as well as Innovation Day, which is intended to really recognize the role of innovation and that knowledge play in just kind of making everyone's lives better, more advanced, more powerful, you know, being able to work smarter, not harder. And so it's also a chance to inspire young folks to pursue education, careers in technology and innovation which has a whole slew of meanings, whether we're talking about the meta, if you're watching on Facebook, maybe even 3D printing. I was just talking about 3D printing last night. So we shall see if I actually get a chance to do something with that. But let's move on. So what can you expect from tonight? Well, you know, we always here on Arizona History Happy Hour, we have a little bit of trivia. We talk about little Arizona. We have a music component as well as From the Vault, which is something you might not even know is there. And of course, there's always a beverage and tonight an oh-so-special guest. So if this is your first time watching, you might wonder, who is that man and why is he on my screen? Well, my name is Marshall Shore, and I got to Arizona 23 years ago. I was working in Brooklyn at a beautiful... Carnegie Building. 
decided to trade it all because of something that you see a little bit in front of the library there, snow, slush, wind, decided it was time to move to someplace sunny. That being right here in Arizona. And I was working in a little library in South Phoenix, which had this rich oral tradition of the community. So my first kind of exposure to Arizona was through stories. And so that heavily has influenced what I'm even doing today, 23 years later. We promptly moved into a beautiful 1956 ranch that is still pretty much original. There is what my kitchen looks like today. All that buttercream yellow tile, the matching yellow in the wall oven, the stovetop that matches, it all still works like a charm. And as soon as we got here, all we have here about how there was no history here. But, you know, I knew that wasn't true because every time I would go somewhere, whether it was on a bike, on foot, on a bus, it didn't matter. I kept coming across so many amazing people, places, and stories. I'm also known as the hip historian. You might wonder, what does that even mean? Well, that means I get to play with Arizona history. And, you know, coming up in early March, my friend Cloty is doing a musical day over at the Heritage Square at the Laugh House on March 24th. And that's going to be a really fun day of music. Um, I also do a lot of things with local buzz, helping get the word out about so many cool things going around, having so much fun around the valley. You still have time to make it out to the Scottsdale Public Library to check out Rip Wood's exhibit. His daughter was a guest a few weeks ago. And coming up on Saturday, we are doing a private VIP tour of the Willow neighborhood. They are doing then the big home tour on Sunday. So if you haven't got your tickets for any of those, there's still a chance you can squeeze into the event. It's going to be so much fun. And I just found out we're actually going to have a special cocktail for our trolley trip through the neighborhood. And then coming up, oh my gosh, that's very soon. Over in the Pioneer Cemetery, over by the um, Capitol, we are doing hats and high tea, which is a fundraiser to help preservation. So that's going to be a lot of fun as we sit in the middle of the cemetery and have a grand old time drinking tea and having fun. And, you know, and more on that in just a moment as well. And coming up March 24th is Arizona Unzipped, an educational burlesque show happening at the Orpheum, that iconic 1929 theater. We just found out that it is the first time burlesque has been there since 1935 when Fanny Bryce performed. So, you know, I'm so happy so many of you have already found the chat. Now, if at any point you need to reach out at some other point, you can reach me on Facebook, Instagram, email, through my website. It's all good because, you know, I love to hear from you all. And of course, it would not be happy hour without a beverage. And so PJ has whipped up the Bolo Mai Tai, which has... Um, Banana de Brazil, some orange curacao, a little bit of lemongrass, and because it is almond day, a little bit of orejata, as well as some Salvadoran rum and some fresh lime juice. And there's what the bolo mai tai looks like. You know, it's so funny. He actually, he works down in Gilbert right now with Belly. They have a space right next to Undertow, which is an iconic tiki bar. They've now opened up a second branch off in Gilbert. That tasted so much like something that you would go into a tiki bar and get. It's quite delicious. All right. So little Arizona. You know, I talk a big game about being from New York, but I really grew up in a small town of like 25 people in the Midwest. And so I kind of had this affinity for big cities and small places. And it's hard to get much smaller than our next town, nothing Arizona. In Mojave County, I mean, literally you cross the border on 93 and you are in nothing. It currently has a population of zero. And I would say it qualifies as probably one of the newest ghost towns in Arizona. 
they're not all just old ghost towns, but we also have new ones. And so Nothing Arizona was established back in 1977. Now it got its name possibly because there was nothing on the stretch of road and some folks just kind of said, you know, let's start this up. In its heyday, it had a population of four. It had a gas station with a convenience store. Sadly, all of that has shut down. But if your car does break down along there, they are home to a ADOT emergency phone that you can make a call from if your cell phone's not working. But what I love is, you know, even though there's nothing and nothing, there is a cell tower. So you likely get really good reception in nothing. Now, also, um, several years ago, they ran a Father's Day special where you could give your dad nothing, where it was a promotion where you got a 24-hour lease on a piece of land that was part of nothing. And so I think that's really funny that people were buying nothing to give away. Almost like, sounds like a Shit's Creek type thing, but all right. So Arizona Street Happy Hour, you know, I love the fact that we have had so many amazing guests on. And it also is a chance for you to hear somebody else's voice other than just mine, which I'm sure is probably a welcomed sight or hear sound wave into your ears. So, all right. So I'm going to bring on my friend, Madam Askew. Hello. Hello. Absolutely. Hello. Thank oh my so gosh, much. look at you. And Thank what you. what is in your cup? Well, nothing as exciting as your bolo mai tai. I'm just having a cup of tea. I feel like I didn't get the memo. Um, but tea is sort of my thing. So, of course, I'm having a little bit of tea. This is a Duchess Grey. So it's like an Earl Grey, but a little bit more refined. It's a little less in your face with the, um, you know, all of the citrus so that's a sort of my poison for the evening. And hello, Lady June Squirrel. I see you there in the comments, my dear. So many people here tonight. What a joy. Indeed. So you, and we're going to have so much fun. So, Madam, for folks that don't, don't know much about you, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Right. Well, I'm a time traveler. And so I really love history, but I like to visit it in person via the power of hopping into my uh, steam-powered teacup with my partner, the Grand Arbiter. And uh, so I make costumes for us so that we can blend in wherever we're going. Mostly we keep visiting Steampunk Landia, which you may have heard of. It's a fantastical place uh, with many silly people. It's wonderful. Everything is steam-powered. Indeed. And so I also know you're going to be um, at Hats and High Tea. That's correct. Yes, I am. I'm joining you and the other wonderful people who make the event happen um, to, to bring a lot of much needed funding to the restoration of the cemetery. And I'll be there to talk about tea and compliments. So we're going to have Oh, a compliments. Oh, oh my yes. gosh. Oh, yes. Now, I'm a compliment master. So be be concerned. I will say nice things to you about yourself. <laughs> oh, I feel that's such a double-edged sword. <laughs> it can be. Because then you have to listen to nice things being said about yourself, which people find strangely very difficult. So, and I say them with such sincerity that it's it's overcoming occasionally. Ah. Yeah. Don't know, Marshall. I may have to compliment your beard. It is very fine. <laughs> it has a mind of its own sometimes. <laughs> so. well, I, I relate. My hair is very much the same, sentient and bound and determined to do what it wants. Exactly. All right. So we have a little bit of trivia. And so now our trivia is not like, you know, if you go to bar trivia, they are more concerned with, do you know the answer, yes or no? Where here, we're more concerned with the story behind the answer. So what we're going to do is we'll go through our questions. They're all multiple choice. So if you don't know the answer, all you got to do is guess. And, you know, there is a likely chance that you will get it right. And then we'll take a little bit of an Arizona music break and come back and talk then about the answers. 
and tell some of those stories there. So now you can keep track. I know if Anita's listening, she is keeping track of them and she has a special notebook that she tracks all of her scores in. And so I've got one friend that continually sends me parts of his body that he's written the answers on. <gasps> Shocking. I do you know. Keep those pieces? Do you have like a Frankenstein version of your friends? <laughs> With lots of wrong answers. That would be really funny. Oh, so awkward. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. It's like, oh my. <laughs> oh no, not your ankle. Oh my goodness. So, so yeah. So we are going to have so much fun this evening. We've got some great questions that I think bring to Arizona parts of Arizona that people don't realize is, are even there. Exciting. Indeed it is. All right. So our first question, known as the Dior of the Desert, this originator of the patio dress was named A, Dolores Gonzalez, B, Lloyd Kiva New, C, Seal Peterson, or D, Susan Clausen. Now, some folks also keep track. You can also throw it in the, in the chat if you just want to throw your answers in there. So it's up to you. No shame, no guilt. It's all good. All right. Question two. Synonymous with the flamboyance of mid-century Western music and fashion, the nudie suit was created by who? And the person was not a native of the Southwest. Was it A, Nudie Cohen? Was it B, Nudie Jeans? C, <laughs> Judy Nudie? <laughs> or Bud Nude? <gasps> Bud Nude. Indeed. A so gentleman. It was one of those folks. So all you got to do is just take a guess and you could be right. You could be wrong. That's part of the fun. All right. The signature ensemble of mariachi performers throughout the Southwest has a long history as the elaborate clothing of the who? Their famous, hor famous horsemen in Mexico. Is it A, the Vaquero, B, the Charo, C, the Caballero, or D, the Sombrero? Who were the famous horsemen where mariachis took um, a flash of that. And so, all right. So on to the next question. What famous tie in the official is the official neckwear of Arizona, New Mexico, and Texas? And Texas. They were a little slow. Though, they they were indeed. But you know, that's Texas. But we're not going to rag on them too much. And so, all right. So was it A, the bow tie? B, the bola tie? C, the bolo tie, or D, the bulldog tie. Oh, crap. And I was going to wear a bulldog. You know, the thing about a bulldog tie is it's very itchy, though. Well, it's, it's very tight. And it's like it's like a it's like a, a painful choker. It's, it's very it's too big. I still have the, I haven't even you know, honestly, I haven't taken them off the card. They're still in the bag from the 50s. And I was like, oh, I was going to break one out. But I did not. So. But you've got it for later. Indeed. But I do have ruffles. <gasps> the ruffles are so good, too. I mean, Indeed. I love this. So that's why I also didn't wear any sort of a neckwear with it, because the only thing I could have done would have been a scarf. That's a, an, an ascot. A nice an ascot. ascot, indeed, or a cravat. Yes. So many options. But I chose none of them this evening. <laughs> All right. Question five. Very... Oh, wait a minute. Okay, okay. Very popular with the mid-century Western fashion. This staple of Southwest attire, the bull tie was patented by who back in the 40s? Was it A, Mary Jennings? B, Bill Close? C, Victor Cedarstaff? Or D, Keith Sheath? You know, Keith Sheath really rolls trippingly off the tongue, doesn't it? I, I know. So I, you know, I was amazed when I saw his name. I was like, it, just the way it rolls off, he could be a performer. He could. He could. Right up there with Magic Mike. <laughs> <laughs> 
so maybe the same similar art form even possibly all right question six dressmakers and sisters with the last name of arrived in phoenix back in 1914 and took residence in heritage square was it a the herberger family b hermes c hernandez or d hoggisgen so which one of those were a couple of sisters that took that made fashion in old heritage square all right question seven famous mid-century frock developed in arizona became one of the official dresses of the american square dancing was it a a rick rack set b a patio set c a quilted set or D, a crinoline set. I do love a Rick Rack set. I'm very keen on Rick Rack, honestly. Oh, I love Rick Rack, especially the metallic Rick Rack. Oh, oh yes. I mean, it's Absolutely. so shiny. Oh my gosh. That's what the copper Rick Rack. I like the classic golds, you know, the good old Star Trek Rick Rack. And indeed. Perfect. All right, question eight. Chinese laborers who were essential in creating the Trans-Pacific Railway, their tradition for preparing what ensured that their drinking water was safe? Was it that they made boba? B, beer? C, soy milk? Or D, tea? So what were those Chinese laborers doing when they weren't laying railway? All right, we're getting close to the end. Only two more questions. Oh my gosh. All right. So, traditional Diné tea is an herbal to stay. Now, how does that word? I say it to same. To same. Okay. Yeah. I've, I've only seen it in print. I haven't actually heard someone say it. So, by boiling what? A native desert herb. Is it A, rose hips? B, wild cherry bark? C, hibiscus, or D, green thread. So which one of those is a traditional Diné tea? All right. And our last question of the evening, tombstone socialite and real estate mogul. Well, originally got busy. her, she was indeed, got her start as a dressmaker to the tombstone elite in the latter part of the 19th century. Was that A, Isabel LeVay, Isabel Greenway, B, C, Queen Isabella Barton, or D, Isabella Hernandez. So which one of those ladies was a socialite and real estate mogul and dressmaker? And oh dressmaker. my God. She was both stylish and organized. To be able to get all that done, especially back then. I mean, even oh, yes. getting fabric would have been a pain in the tuchus. It's true. To get anything other than calico. Yeah. Yes. Probably the latest fabrics from Paris. Yeah, maybe through the ports of San Francisco. Indeed. Via the railway. Right. So see, we've come full circle. Textiles, railways, so it's all good. Okay, so while you are locking in your final answers, we are going to take a little bit of an Arizona music break. And so, you know, we just had Arizona statehood. And so, you know, I knew that Arizona had two state official songs, but I said, you know, let's see what else we can find. And oh my gosh. So 1919, the Arizona March song became the official Arizona state song. All right. I don't and think I've ever heard it. It's it's not, it doesn't really roll off the tongue that well. <laughs> it kind of hits the ear like a stagecoach. Oh, good. <laughs> um, then there's the ever popular um, 1981 Rex Allen Jr. song called Arizona or I Love You, Arizona. And so that's the one that most people know. In fact, I was on the phone with a friend today and he started singing it to me. So, 
And then I found back in 1901, the territorial legislature liked the song Arizona Sun-Kissed Land. I couldn't find any recording of this or anything. I found the lyrics. That's about as best as I could get. But I'm intrigued to see if I can find it. So I've actually got calls into the music library at ASU to see what they can find and see if we can find a recording of this. Well, that is exciting, or at least the sheet music, perhaps. Indeed, so that way somebody could play it, So, which would be really interesting. And then I discovered, so back in 1953, the Phoenix Ad Club had a competition for a new Arizona song. Oh. And so Jimmy McDonald and Jack Hoffman won for their song, so they, got a, they won $1,000 back in 1953. A now, they had been... Song. Yeah, so they had been known to work on Crocodile Tears. They've done a song with Doris Day. They also did Eisenhower, We Love the Sunshine of Your Smile. So, it, I mean, I was able to find the lyrics, but again, it says, oh, I wasn't able to find any sheet music or recording. Now, at that point, the head of the Arizona or the Phoenix Ad Club was Ray Boley, who was also running Canyon Records at the time. So he would have had a way to create records. So I'm assuming that they did. So we're trying in right now, trying to find out if there is indeed a recording of that. Fingers crossed. So well, yeah. that's exciting. That's or, exciting. Or at least, again, or sheet music. Maybe at some point we can have a quartet of music playing all just Arizona music that may or may not be the official state song. I love that. All right. So now who's ready for some answers? Very exciting. And Lady June Squirrel, these could be for the Cog Match game. But I promise you, I try to be as serious as possible. When oh, I indeed, was... yes, because it's such a serious show. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm a very serious person. You know Same. that about me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> indeed. Yeah, I don't laugh at myself at all. Never. All right. So our first question, known as the Dior of the Desert, this originator of the patio dress was named Dolores Consuelo Barcelo Gonzalez. And uh, she and Seal Peterson were both very popular, very important. And also uh, they both promoted the dress, but Dolores is sort of the originator. And I think often gets lost in the conversation. Here in Tucson, everyone knows Seal Peterson. She's a very important figure, but so is Dolores. And I was sort of delighted to learn more about her uh, when I was doing a little bit of research for this. So, and actually coming up in the end of April, I have a friend who is doing a whole workshop on the dresses that Gonzalez created and, and helped make famous. Yes. So for um, that is for Arizona Tuki Oasis, which is happening over at the Westward Ho. Excellent. Yeah, and the dresses are beautiful. They're really, I think they're sort of classically elegant, uh, perfect for our Arizona climate, actually. Well, and that was the whole thing of them. I mean, it was really became kind of a symbol of the Southwest. Uh, one of the things I love about these dresses is that it really allowed women. I know here in Phoenix, almost every corner had a woman who had a dress shop. Yeah. And so Absolutely. it gave them a way to make income for themselves instead of being tied to their husband. Yeah. And I mean, we don't have that sort of industry precisely anymore. People do more ready to wear fast fashion from their local uh, market. But for a long time, that sort of dressmaking industry was very important um, for women of all sorts of classes to better their lot. You see that story again and again, which is right. We'll, we'll see that story again later. In the Indeed. Episode. And so actually my friend Jenny, who's doing the presentation, also has one of the pleaders that you would use for oh. one of those dresses. Oh, my goodness. That is fantastic because that's I mean, a lot of pleats. That's a lot, a lot of pleats. Mm -hmm. So so I'll be sure and have her send you a photo of it. 
Yes, please. Okay. Yes, it, yes, it's yes. quite. It's quite. It's, it's like when people see it, they're like, "Is that an air, air filter?" Because it's just all these rods sticking up. Yeah, they're amazing, and you really. I do make dresses. I will set in pleats for something like that. You really do want a pleater. It's too hard to do, um, you know, manually by hand. So, yeah, in, I love that. Indeed. Oh, it helps if you click on the right button. All right. So synonymous of flamboyance of mid-century Western music and fashion. The nudie suit was created by who? Nudie Cohen. Oh, my goodness. I love nudie suits. <gasps> Honestly, they're amazing. Yes, they are. And I love his story and his origin. Um, so for those who don't know, Nudie Cohen is from uh, Kiev originally, and he had to flee as a child from, you know, czarist pogroms, uh, anti-Jewish pogroms. So his family came to the United States. He brought all this beautiful tradition of Eastern European embroidery and embellishment with him. And then he applied that to these amazing western wear suit so it's just such a fantastic you know story of um endurance resilience and also this beautiful marrying of traditions into something uniquely its own uh, and they're just fantastic the nudie suits are amazing yeah i mean and just i mean just look i mean and i mean he was synonymous with that like that elvis style i mean Porter Wagner, Dolly Parton, even Elton John. Yes. I mean, if you were a, if you were of that ilk, you had a nudie suit. Absolutely, and uh, they're making a bit of a comeback um, as a thing, thanks to Little Nos X. Thank you, Indeed. Little Nos X, for bringing back this beautiful art form. So gorgeous. And he's small enough to be able to fit in them. All the ones that I've seen, I could fit my thigh in, but oh, that's all. So. Yeah. Dolly Parton is a very petite person in most regards. She has some dimensions that are not petite, but overall she you is. You know, because her hair petite. is really big. Her hair is huge. Yes. She needs like an entire, actually, she has so much hair in so many varieties that she just put into wig form. She needs her own trailer to just <laughs> transport. <laughs> 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 oh <laughs> that's hilarious thank you a wig mobile a wig mobile uh, as you do indeed all right so the signature ensemble of mariachi performers has a long history of being taken from what famous horseman in mexico and that would be be the charo the charo yeah and uh, you know there's Obviously, the nudie suit and the charo suit are not the same thing, but you can see how nudie con was like inspired a little bit. And this is sort of, you could probably do some deep dives into the ornamentation that exists on the charo suits and how that made it to Mexico. Um, see those little wonderful pathways and byways by which fashion is absolutely intricate intrinsically bound together right no matter where you're from but i i love the charo suit and we see it come up again and again in beautiful historic photography of mexico and i'm really delighted that this tradition of suit and dressmaking continues for mariachi musicians today because it's absolutely stunning right Indeed. So I had friends who were getting married in Tucson. They were getting married against one of the mountains and I couldn't afford to stay close to the mountains. So I stayed downtown oh. after the wedding. I show up at my hotel and it's late at night. I did not realize I was staying at the headquarters of the International Mariachi Festival. So I walk into the lobby and it is a sea of mariachis from four years old to 80. Oh and my they were just having this huge jam session dressed in their best, the bill, the big belt buckles, everything. Gorgeous. You know, I should have just ditched the wedding and just spent the day there. Would have been I mean, much more fun. 
the music was absolutely absurd and off the hook. As oh the my gosh. And they, what was really great was they were co so considerate because one of them would play a little bit, step back, and someone else would step forward. So it was just oh. constant. I mean, Not just, that. oh, it was so much fun. Well, since you've been to Tucson many times, I'm certain, uh, Lady June Squirrel's mentioning uh, El Charo, which is also oh. a wonderful restaurant, a, a local gem downtown in Tucson. And so next time you're downtown, you should really, you know, meander over there and enjoy a meal. It's very good. Also, the margaritas are delightful. Ah, I do not doubt that. Yeah. yeah. They don't know me, but I know them. <laughs> <laughs> All right. What famous tie is the official neckwear of Arizona, New Mexico, and Texas? And it was a little bit of a trick question because there's two correct answers. It's B and C. So if you put either the bola tie or the bolo tie, they are the same thing, but they it's like there's one group that, I mean, as you can see here, was the passing of the bola tie bill. I and that is that. so close, the, the kind of the grandfather of the one that helped it become the official neckwear of Arizona. So fantastic. I, I honestly, I love um, a, a bola tie, a bolo tie. I, as a time traveler, I'm not always the um, best at knowing the right answer to these things, but I'd always heard bolo tie. I'm from away, however, and I'm fascinated by this heated debate over whether it's bola or bolo. Indeed. And, you know, and they keep, it's like, and, you know, and there's all this, everyone's all this, like, people say, oh, they're going out of fashion, but then they come back in fashion. I mean, it's like they came back in the 80s and they're having another resurgence right now. I mean, if you walk into one of the hips, hipster bars here, that's what the 20 something bartender has on is a bolo or a bola. I should ask them whether they're wearing a bola or a bolo. Right, really put them on the spot. <laughs> exactly. Making your, your beverage. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and somebody was just talking about how it's now getting harder and harder to even find bolos. Yeah. I, they're, being, they're being snapped up. You know, I have a wee collection from my grandfather who was very fond of them. And I see that Lady June uh, has her husband Clem's uh, collection as well. They are treasures if you have them. And um, I I thought they just weren't being made anymore. And that's why you couldn't find them. But now, now I know the young people are snatching them up again. Exactly. So don't be so shocked if you go somewhere and there's somebody wearing a bolo. And for those attending uh, Stephen Park Landia events, I think we should really be bringing the bowler tie with us. It's, you know, just throw some gears at it, maybe have a little steam powered engine on it to like help it slip up and down the ties. Perfect. Exactly. I mean, and they can be worn whether tight up at the neck or loose. So, I mean, they can be very casual, they can be formal, saucy, cheeky. Indeed. All the so actually, I do have one that is, um, oh gosh, who was the governor that was impeached? Um, uh, aren't there several? Weren't there there are several. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and it's him with his foot in his mouth, made by a oh. local artist. So Oh, perfect. That's in, indeed. Great. So you can find artists made. Um, you know, the herd market is coming up very soon next month. That's a great place to go look for bolos. Yes, Ed Meekum, indeed. So it is Ed Meekum with his foot stuck in his mouth. I'm certain that's exactly where it belonged to. <laughs> well, nobody would want to wear something else around their neck. But... <laughs> <laughs> All right. So very popular with the Midwestern fashions. This staple of the Southwestern attire, the bolo tie, was patented by who back in the 40s? Victor Cedar staff. Indeed. And you can see his style is a little different than what you find in most places, but I have seen this style actually starting to make a comeback. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, he's, he seems like an interesting character. I think he was a, a ranch and or a cowboy. 
And um, this is the sort of thing where he patented it and claimed to be the author of its creation. But it is very hard to actually, uh, you know, tie down, if you will excuse the pun, who may have created the bolo. Uh, it seems like the sort of thing we can see some predecessors of historically before uh, Mr. Cedar Staff uh, patented it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So kind of like Facebook did. I mean, was it really created by the person who said they created or was it if you've watched the show, maybe there's some drama there. Maybe there's some bola drama. I mean, there's definitely some bola drama, don't you think? Indeed. There's a musical there waiting to happen. <laughs> I want to see the dance routines. Really. Oh, I have a feeling they would be inspired by Star Trek. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. I hope this comes to pass now. <laughs> <laughs> we can, exactly. We can only hope. Mm, mm. All right. So question six, dressmakers and sisters. What was the last name? And they arrived in Phoenix back in 1914 and took residence up at Heritage Square. And you now, I have never heard the name pronounced. I've never heard it pronounced either. I've only seen it in print. They're from Luxembourg, and I must admit, whilst I do speak a language or two, uh, that is not one of them. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> so we'll just make up how you pronounce the name. Houston, maybe. Oh, uh, that's probably much better than my, the way I pronounced it. I just saw the T J. I was like, oh, it's a house T J. Uh, yeah, a house T J. That. Sounds, I mean, it sounds very charming and emphatic at the same time. So, right, but I think, but I think your your way probably is more likely the poss it's possible, but also, you know, uh, Luxembourg could surprise us both with like a silent G, or <laughs> right? Exa exactly, like, who knows? I don't know. Someone from Luxembourg, I'm certain, but I don't know if they're here to correct us. However, I love that these sisters came over and started a dressmaking business in Heritage Square. It's such a beautiful part of Phoenix. And I I knew that there had to be a, a dressmaker there and we found them. So indeed. And I love that their house is historic there as well, as well as the dress shop. So fantastic. So and I'm glad that both those buildings survived. I love that. So, yeah, and so that is that is the dress shop, and I actually even went through and found an ad. I love this ad. It's it's they have a phone. They have a phone. That's so fantastic. Well, and it's so funny because it's four digits. You don't even have like the Alpine or anything. It's just four digits. So would you have to call the operator and say, "Hey, you know, connect me to 1581. I have a dress emergency." Right. Uh, my hem's fallen and it can't get up. <laughs> and I can't show my ankles off. No. Well, 1914, they were still wearing fairly long frocks. And they Indeed. hadn't quite exposed the ankle, you, you know. So, yes, hems were very important. They were. And... Uh, Correct me, 1914, we're just slightly before World War I, aren't we? So, Right, it's also just after Arizona becomes a state. Right. So very interesting time in history to be making dresses. And especially, I mean, and I think you start having, um, a little later than this is when you start having women starting to show up places in pants, creating yes. such a hullabaloo. Because, oh. oh my gosh, they're not wearing a dress, they're wearing something with a split scandalous bifurcation exposing that they have limbs below the waist that was supposed to be a great mystery how women perambulated just we sort of <laughs> hovered about with our petticoats you know it was the great mystery indeed now the mystery is solved all right, so that famous mid-century frock called what was developed in Arizona and became one of the official dresses of the American square dancing. The patio set. And it was there was a fair amount of rickrack with this dress on the regular. So mm -hmm. 
one could be excused for thinking, you know, it was the Rick Rack set. Um, I think it also goes by the Fiesta set. Uh, right. So it's had a few names. Some of them are, you know, names we don't use anymore. They're inappropriate. Right, because they're kind of derogatory. Yeah, and in are. the time period, I mean, even with this, this was an article out of Life magazine about Lloyd Kiva New. And, and it says that kind of name that we don't, we no longer use for the patio set. And um, so, but I, you know, it's so interesting the fact that it grew out of, it started off in Tucson. You then had Lloyd Kiva New who kind of made it the smashing success that it was. Yeah. And, and then so, it was picked up by American Square Dancing, which I'm just, I think, what an interesting confluence of things. If you meet a square dancer, they are unlikely to tell you that, yes, I'm wearing my patio set. Right, Normally, they it's just a square dancing dress. It's sort of right. lost a little bit of its connection with its origin. So I love learning more about where this dress came from who developed it and sort of how it became so popular in the mid-century and the fact that i mean yeah you add and it's like for this greatest thing they had just a lot of crinoline so that gave that skirt with all those pleats a lot of poof a lot of fluff you know zhuzhed the dress a little bit if you will exactly so i guess the bigger the dress the smaller you looked that's correct, actually. That's correct, actually. So, but, yeah. You know, you wanted, uh, we weren't doing the same sort of um, underpinnings in the middle of the 20th century as we did in the 19th century, but we still had some structured foundation garments like girdles, and there was still a desire for that new look, the Dior new look with the small waist, the nipped in waist and the the sweep of the hips and to do that hourglass. So you needed a distinction between the shoulders, the waist and the hips and having all of those fluffy petticoats really made it possible to give yourself a small looking waist without having to tight laced into a corset. Indeed. And you can still breathe. Yeah. Well, you know, I must admit, Marshall, that I can breathe in my course. I have yet to asphyxiate oh. myself. It's very important. Well, obviously. But, yeah. So, but it is cooler and more comfortable not to have quite so many layers. Although girdles, my darlings, are really not a comfortable garment either, to be honest. <laughs> I would believe that. Yeah. I don't recommend them for summer wear. No, not in the desert. Oh, my gosh. No, no, no. no. Throw more petticoats on that. Burn the girdle. Add petticoats. That's a much better plan of attack. I would agree with that. All right. Chinese laborers who laid the railway also had a special concoction that they would prepare, making sure the drinking water was safe. And what was it? Tea. 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 Indeed. If you boil your water, you can really do away with so many uh, bacteria, virus, all sorts of... You can't completely improve your water entirely, but it makes a big difference for the healthfulness of what you're drinking. Indeed it does. And it's also just a tasty libation. It is. Now, I couldn't find any, you know, real literature or academic research, but I recall years ago uh, hearing a story on NPR that um, when some of the rail workers were, uh, they, they did strike unsuccessfully, and it's unfortunate that they were not successful, but in some of their unrest, there was a demand for more tea, and that the need for tea for the rail workers was such that it really shifted tea imports and tea production in oh. the United States because they drank so much tea. It was their main libation. Well, and in the desert, I mean, trying to make sure that whatever water they had access to was actually safe to drink. Yeah, for reals potable, not just something liquid that was 
being given to them. It was sort of dicey. You boil it and you can probably drink it. So, Indeed. All right. Traditional Diné tea is an herbal tea saying made by boiling what? A native desert herb. Greens, right? I, I, I'm assuming that's how it's pronounced. Could be wrong. Every now and again, a word will look a certain way, and I assume all the letters are pronounced and they're not. Um, but I'm assuming that it's green thread. And I love that this uh, tradition continues um, because so many of the culinary traditions and and the traditional food culture of the First Nations people have been obscured or lost. Um, and so it's wonderful that this continues on, is something that people continue to cultivate and enjoy. Of course, you can find it sold in, you know, in sachets, but the tradition is to bundle up your little, you know, little clump of your herbs and just boil those directly in the water with any sweetener or whatnot that you like. Ah. I'm certain it's lovely. I, I like caffeinated things, but if you like a tisane, I'm certain it's lovely. Well, and then, you know, there's also some of those Japanese medicinal teas, which are quite yes. potent. Yes. Oh, the and nose and the tongue. Oh, oh, yes. And, you know, one can find some very potent uh, herbal concoctions, herbal teas, herbal tisanes from the Chinese tradition as well and they are definitely good for you and are definitely potent so you will smell them <laughs> indeed all right and here we are at our last question tombstone socialite and real estate mogul got her start as a dressmaker to the tombstone elite Isabella Van She's an interesting character, a dressmaker who, who made her way out of Tombstone. Uh, I think from Sacramento, she had been married previously and her husband and two of her children died from tuberculosis, as was very, like, much more common. So right. as a widow with two more children, she made her way to Tombstone to start a dressmaking business. Um, I'm certain that she had done, she wasn't just learning to sew and then picking up sticks. She'd already been a dressmaker, but she was lured out to Tombstone, sort of a bustling, you know, a little bit of a boom town. And with the promise of clientele and opportunities to improve her fate and to support her children. It clearly worked out for her because she ended up owning buildings and getting remarried to a bit of a cad, but still... She didn't ask me my opinion on who she was marrying, and it she did end up with the property, so maybe it wasn't all bad. Well, and you know, and it was Tombstone, which was full of all kinds of scoundrels. So that's true. Not shocking she would have found one. No, she did. She did find one. Uh, there's a lot of interesting minutia of how she ended up being the recipient of the properties to avoid his debt collectors, which I think is delightful. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, she was very successful and she made dresses uh, in the uh, latter part of the 19th century. So I can absolutely imagine the sorts of dresses she was making and how absolutely sumptuous they were and also hot and heavy, unlike the patio set, these dresses would be scads and scads of yards, you know, no no fewer than 10 yards of fabric, just so oh much froth and nonsense. So very weighty affairs, but beautiful. Indeed. And I mean, and her story was so popular that I actually, we were talking about the fact there was a musical that someone did about her. So fantastic. I just, I feel a need to hear this musical. Now. I know. I'm kind of like, it's like, now it's like, I need to find out. And I think it was down in Tucson that it was done. So now we need to try to track down the crowd that did it. And like, okay, did they take, did they make a videotape? Is there some, is there a recording of any kind? Can we hear right. this musical? Oh my goodness. I, I love that that exists in the world. I, and her obituary, she died in the 
1980s, I believe. So she's wow. She, she had lived quite... through a lot of the 20th century. Wow. A real pip. I'm certain she was an absolute firecracker. I mean, how could she not have been? Right. Now, and uh, with a name like that, Isabel Levan, it's like she went by Belle and it just, it paints a real picture, doesn't it? So, yeah. Indeed. I mean, hence why I'm not shocked someone did a musical about it. No, no. Colourful. So maybe maybe one of us will track down the musical one of these days and give it a listen. Indeed. Well, you know, you let me know if you find anything. I'll let you know I if should. I find anything. So thank you. I we might have, have a viewing party. <gasps> oh, I love a viewing party. Indeed. Viewing party. Yeah, that would be so much fun. Absolutely, that would be a delightful time. Well, Indeed. thank you for hosting my uh, questions, Marshall. That was ever so fun. Oh, indeed. So I always like to end with asking people how they did, because, you know, some of these may have been a bit obscure. They were. But, you they know, were. I think, but, you know, but that is part of our history and our heritage. And I mean, and that's the thing, especially women in the Southwest went from wearing these dresses from the East to being able to finally wear pants and that and doing it earlier than other places did. I think a lot of it was because of the weather and things. The weather, yes. the snakes, the cacti. Pants are a good idea, really. Trousers. I and, mean, yes. Pants are always a good idea. So are trousers. With pockets. With pockets. Who doesn't want a good pocket? I love a pocket. I like to have two pockets, ideally, one for each hip. Exactly. And so, and the nice thing when you make your own clothes, you can put pockets wherever you would like. Oh, oh, yes. I mean, I also love to hide pockets in obscure parts of the garment where you not, would not oh. expect. Uh, this is a bit of a detour, but the Victorian ladies had more pockets than you would suspect. They were very clever with where they would put their pockets. And as they mostly didn't carry purses, that was a 20th century phenomenon, they needed oh. the pockets. So they would they would make, they'd have cuff pockets, they'd have front opening pockets, they'd have a little pocket in the facing of their bodies, they'd have side seam pockets, pockets hidden in their waistband, so many pockets, it was great. Wow, who knew? But that makes perfect sense because they weren't carrying purses. They were not. They were not. They might carry something like a reticule, but those are very small. They right. would not have very much in them. Um, and they had all the needs to carry things that we do today. They also use something called a chatelaine, which is like a little clip that hung from your waist, a bit like a carabiner. They would hang their, their keys and little tools from those. They'd be decorative and useful, which is sort of the 19th century all over. Decorative, but useful. Indeed. So, oh my gosh, this has been so much fun. Thank you. It's been a delight. Thanks for letting me, uh, you know, wax rhapsodically on fashion. It's one of my favorite things. I, you know, it was like I was just talking about fashion, well, just yesterday, some of that history and things. So it's like, you know, that's kind of the fun thing about Arizona is you never know quite where the little bits of history are going to come and go. That's true. Arizona is a remarkable place. And you and I shall be talking about all sorts of things at the end of the month. Indeed. And so if you would like to hear more of our conversation, please join us at the Pioneer Cemetery down by the Capitol on February 25th, coming up in just nine days. Shocking. And Sweet. I know there's still some tickets left. And so you can go to azhistcemeteries.org and you can find out how you can get one of those remaining tickets. And I know we have a great selection of tea already happening. So it's going to be such a fun event. I look forward to seeing you, madam, as well as a whole host of folks that I haven't seen. This is the first time we've done this event in three years. It's true. It's so lovely to be back. The, the 
our last meeting in 2020, shortly before everything changed. It was such yeah. a joyous, wonderful event. The food was delightful. The tea was excellent. But the company was the best part of all. Right. I mean, and we'll have Joe, who is um, basically there working with the preservation from the East Coast. Um, and so I know he is going to be making a lot of treats for this event as well. Oh, my goodness. He's quite skilled. He is. Me. He's an amazing baker. So we're going to have some sumptuous treats. Wonderful. Some decadent teas. And you'll get to tour the cemetery, which is an amazing landmark. Um, so much history is encapsulated there. And you'll get to see us. In... You're going to be giving a talk, right? Marshall? I'm watching MC, so... So good. I know. I haven't even planned what I'm going to wear yet, but you know, there's plenty of time. You have nine days. Exactly. So much time. Right. That's all the time in the world. I'm certain mm. you will look very dapper. <laughs> that is the goal. <laughs> so. I'm looking forward to seeing you there and to seeing everyone there as well. Thank you so much for having me as a guest today. This was oh, It was delightful. so good to see you. And I look forward to seeing you in just a little over a week. So cheers, madame. Cheers, Marshall. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you to all of your friends and my friends who are here as well. This has been a really wonderful evening. Indeed. Thank you so much and have a great rest of your night. You too. Thank you. Cheers. All right. So now we get ready for From the Vault, which is something you might not even know is there. And so for today, we are going to talk. So yesterday was kind of the reception for the ASU Art Museum. They have this opportunity reflection, which is a 10 foot tall stainless steel sculpture that's been highly polished which really rep which looks a lot like the Vince Lombardi trophy given away to the winning Super Bowl team. Um, it was done by Hank Willis, Willis Thomas, who is a black artist. And so they did this amazing kind of zoom panel talking about the history and why this is important. What I love is it is on display until March, 2024. So you've got plenty of time to go see opportunity reflection at the SU Art Museum. It's right out front. So even if you just drive by, I bet you can even see it as you just walk by. It'll be there. Also, they've got a great exhibit up right now talking about invisibility. And I know that's going to be, there's going to be more stuff coming along with that as well. So check out the exhibit as well. And so just stop by the SU Art Museum because they've got a lot, they've got a lot going on. And so... And this is why I will always say, if you're watching on Facebook, there is that share button. You want to click on share because, oh my gosh, we are having so much fun with Arizona history. Who knew? And next week we have Brad, who is the president of the Melrose District Business Association, as they are getting ready for the M7 Street Fair which is an amazing street fair. And we're going to talk about some of the history of Melrose, as well as some of the history of food trucks and things like that right here in Arizona. So that's going to be a really fun and edible show. We shall see what comes out of that. So guaranteed a lot of fun. So remember, I always love to hear from you. So if you have any questions, stories, suggestions, please give me a shout out. Um, I always love to give a shout out to Chris and Cole, who did that really great video at the beginning, as well as PJ for constantly bringing amazing cocktails. And as we say goodnight, I am going to play a little bit of a short that would have been shown before we would have seen a movie called Western Fashions. Marianne, arriving in Phoenix for an Arizona vacation, is greeted by Joyce, who is wearing a typical Western squaw dress from the Arizona Fashion Council. After shopping in nearby Scottsdale, Marianne models her own squaw dress with mandarin neckline. Now, off to Camelback Inn, nestled in Arizona's Valley of the Sun. For traveling, squaw dresses are pretty and practical. 
After washing, the full skirt can be pleated by just drying it in a stocking. Strolling Camelback's grounds, Joyce wears a one-piece outfit with an off-the-shoulder neckline. Mary Ann's two-tone skirt and blouse is trimmed with ball fringe and has a bow at the neckline. The call of the wide open spaces beckons the girls to the corral. Mary Ann wears a typical western outfit, frontier pants, cotton blouse, and Stetson hat. Joyce models an overblouse of velvet, patterned after those worn by the Indian princesses who long ago rode here in the Valley of the Sun.